If you'll take your Bibles for our scripture reading this morning, we turn to Romans chapter 10. One of the great challenges for a pastor, and perhaps a double challenge for a pastor who comes visiting from another denomination, a sister denomination, and one that uh, over the course of uh, my ministry, a course of some 30 years, has grown ever fonder and ever closer, uh, is to bring that word to you. Uh, to, to come north across the border. And uh, it's been my desire for some time to do that. Uh, but as you know, in God's providence, uh, the travel across the border had been um, hindered for the last few years. But in his good grace, he has uh, allowed those doors to be opened again. And so it is my great delight as God's servant to uh, open his word and bring his word to you. So turn your attention to Romans chapter 10. Our uh, primary text will be the verses 14 through 17, but I think we need to read the whole of the chapter uh, to gain a greater uh, feel for the uh, context of uh, our brother, Apostle Paul, uh, in the word he brings. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for the Jews, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between the Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel of Isaiah, for our gospel. For Isaiah says, who, Lord, who has blessed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. May God bless us in his word. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, as we we have heard this word as we prepare our hearts to hear the explanation. We pray that you may bless your word to your people this day. Amen. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, salvation does not come from national identity or mystical experience or philosophy or blind faith. It is not inherited by tradition, guaranteed by baptism or church membership, outward adherence to a set of rules or conformity to a group. 
Salvation is the result of hearing and having faith in Jesus Christ as the only Savior through the gospel message of the Word of God. Saving faith comes through obtaining a knowledge of the Creator, Redeemer, God, who calls you through the preaching of the Word unto new life through His Son by the regenerating power of His Holy Spirit. The great commission of the church, of the called out people of God, is to preach the word to all nations. In other words, to be in the business of evangelism of the lost. We as the church are to make disciples by going into the world and confronting people with the gospel and then discipling them in that word to nurture a saving faith. Many think this call to go into the world is to send missionaries to Africa and the Philippines. And it's worthy for us to be engaged in that work. But what the Lord had in mind is to go into the world that is around us, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family. That the word, the gospel spreads in just that way. What is meant by that? is that true faith, saving faith, grows in the heart of the believer through gaining knowledge and experience in a worthy walk. There is an often overlooked side to evangelism, and it is this, that evangelism of the soul does not stop when one is baptized and joins the church, or is confirmed, or makes profession of faith. It has only begun. Every day, you should be occupied with allowing yourself to be evangelized by the Word of God. To experience in that worthy walk a growing in love for God and His church. To communicate the gospel to others, you must also nurture the gospel in your own life through daily reading and prayer and worship. But Paul here speaks more specifically in Romans chapter 10 in the verses 14 through 17, of that unique role that God has ordained preaching to function in the life of the church and in your life as a Christian. To neglect the preaching of the word of God is to shun God's ordained means of grace, which include the preaching of the word and the sacraments and Christian fellowship. But of those, the primary The of these is the preaching of the word of God. It is the duty of pastors and elders, according to Acts chapter 20, in the verses 20 and 21, not to shrink from declaring to you anything that is profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is incumbent on the faithful pastor to declare the whole counsel of God. And while that is the duty of the faithful pastor, you must, not, you must also embrace with enthusiasm your calling to make yourself available to that preaching so that your faith may be strengthened and that you may grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18. All of this becomes clear in Romans chapter 10 and the verses 14 through 17, which teaches that saving faith is produced in the hearer through the preaching of the word. We will consider this under three points, the hearer of the word, the preacher of the word, and the faith through the word. So first, the hearer of the word. We see that in verse 14, where we read, how then Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? A pattern is set before you. A pattern to consider that goes like this. How will you be able to call or worship God if you do not believe? And how will you be able to believe in a God that you have never heard of? And how will you ever hear of God if there is no one to tell you? And then there is this added point. How shall someone tell you about the true God if they are not sent by that God to preach to you? 
The emphasis at first might flow toward this being a passage about preachers. Always a dangerous proposition for the preacher in the pulpit to preach about himself. But, but the reality is, as you, you focus on this passage, the focus is correctly on you, the hearer. And even the one in the pulpit must be a hearer. Your saving faith depends on the quality of your hearing the, of the true gospel of God. A, a gospel that is opening an opening of and true to the Bible, the God of Scripture. Jesus would on regular occasions, when confronted by his enemies, end his teaching with this statement. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And what do you think he meant by that? It's one of those odd sayings, right? And the answer is, those who have the heart and the mind and are willing to receive and embrace the truth of God's word will believe what is said and commit to living by it. You know, Jesus had that series of passages, I am the door, I am the vine, I am the good shepherd. And in there he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. The context here in Romans 10 is Paul making the point that the Jews' rejection of Jesus, they did not have the ears to hear, became the open door for the gospel to go to the Gentiles and saving faith to spread throughout the whole world. Paul inserted in I, words from Isaiah 53, 1 and verse 16, where he said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Who's the they? Well, it's primarily the Jews, but it's those who hear the word of God. They have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? He did so to make the point, Paul did so to make the point that the kind of hearing that he was speaking of had to do with hearing with the ear of faith. You have a responsibility before God regarding how you respond to the preaching of the word. God's word is proclaimed with a purpose. And a couple chapters later, Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be, this is God speaking, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth through Isaiah, but God's saying it's through my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. By way of application, the question that arises is this. What kind of a hearer are you? Do you pay attention during the preaching as if it were God speaking to you, or are you distracted by things that you have to do? playing with your phone or something that takes your focus from the hearing. In other words, do you, do you take this day of the week as seriously as you should? You know, it was Jesus who said in Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you believe it is God's will that you are saved by the blood of Christ, you must be sure that faith is coupled with the belief that God ordained the means as well as the end of your salvation. And the means of saving faith is the hearing of the word of God that produces in you a love to grow in your faith through the preaching of that word. And to accomplish providing you with the means of saving faith, what does God do? God sends preachers and teachers. Which brings us to our second point, the preacher of the word. We see that in verse 15. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now he's not really talking about good looking feet here. The, the emphasis here is that the one who's bringing the message of victory, the message of the gospel, the good news, is, is one who is to be appreciated, to, to see him coming, to have that desire to see him coming, to search him out, to hear what is to be said. 
The word preach used here in verse 15, how are they to preach, is to publicly announce religious truths and principles while urging acceptance and compliance. To preach. You know, maybe you've heard people say to somebody who's kind of waxing on about what we should do and shouldn't do, now you're just preaching at us. Well, you know, there's a sense in which as Christians, we want to be preached at. We, we want God's word to come and to confront us and to challenge us, not just to bring us comfort and make us feel good, but likewise to challenge us to be more, to walk worthy in Christ, to point out those areas wherein we falter. The, the unbeliever shrinks to the darkness because they love darkness, but the Christian comes into the light that our weaknesses, our sins, our failings may be exposed. To what end? That we might overcome them through the power of God and the strength of Christ. We don't mind being preached at. In fact, we appear every Sunday morning to be preached at. And the minister who fails to do that sometimes discourages us because we desire that. In terms of the minister of the word, it is to preach the word of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What do we mean by reconciled? It means bringing into balance, bringing back into a right relationship. It's at the heart of, of our justification, of our being made right with God. God is in his son, Jesus Christ, reconciling the world to himself, bringing us back into the relationship. It is, it is God in the garden calling Adam and Eve out of the bushes. There is a caution here. Not all who are preachers are sent by God. You must be careful in your listening that you are not engaged with false prophets. 1 John 4, 1, the, the apostle says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many who claim to be church are not church. And we know that. But how do you test the spirits? By their compliance to the word of God. When they teach things or come in a way that is contrary to scripture, then they are false prophets. God's word clearly sets forth the qualifications for the elder and the pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so when we look to the one who is to be the pastor and the elder, the pastor and the teacher, they have to be biblically qualified. And going back to Romans 10, 15, the Greek word there, euangelizomenon, sometimes we hear it more as euangelizo, appears, which is here translated as those who preach the good news. But you hear in there, in that Greek word, our word evangelize. And it's also the word from which we get the word gospel, good news. It expresses the idea of preaching or gospelizing, but it is what they preach that should catch your attention. Now I'm going to point out here that there's a variant in the Greek text worth noting. There is something that appears in the New King James that is absent in the ESV. The preaching of the gospel appears with two aspects in the New King James. It is the first part that is missing, where it is called the gospel of peace. We're to preach a gospel of peace. And this points to the redemption of our Lord Jesus who brings peace between the sinner and a holy God. It is the word of reconciliation that Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Entrusting to us the message of real reconciliation. To what end? Not only to grant to us that assurance of pardon, but that we might take that word out to those who need the assurance of pardon, to call them to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. 
The second modifier found in both translations is that the gospel or the good news is, good, uh, is of good things. That is, the summary of the gospel, what God does for the benefit of us all, is good. And the pinnacle of that goodness is revealed in his willingness to extend salvation to sinners through his son, Jesus Christ. What should be the message of the preacher? Primarily, it should be focused on the grace of God through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ applied to the believer by the working of the Holy Spirit. Preaching the whole counsel of God requires taking on the subjects of sin and proper living, but they should always be founded upon the grace of God through the work of Christ on the cross. Paul saw his primary mission as one of preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes on about that at length in, in the book of 1 Corinthians where there's a tremendous amount of influences in that city of philosophers traveling through and, and different uh, people believing in God. And often the Corinthian Christians would go off to the, to the temple, which was kind of the gathering place, the restaurant in town. They didn't have restaurants and various places. They went to the idol worship of Diane and they would have their meals and the philosophers would come in there and they would mingle and they'd say, why can't we be more like that? It's more exciting, more dynamic. And Paul takes them to task. And he says, I'm glad I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men, but I came to you with the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's interest was not only to see sinners brought to saving faith, but also to see saving faith grow in the lives of the hearers. And that brings us to our final point, the faith that comes through the word. We see it in verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In Romans 10, 17, we find one of those verses like Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 that should become so familiar to you as a Christian that it's always on your mind. In Ephesians 2, beginning of verse 8, the Apostle Paul goes on, for by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he before ordained that we should walk in them. That's something that every single day should be for front and center in our minds, along with this verse, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and, and I want greater faith, Lord. So let me dwell in your word. Let me meditate it upon it day and night. It is more precious than gold, yes, than much fine gold. The Christian is described in several ways. Some of the clearest expressions reflect their faith commitment. The believer is a follower of the book, a disciple of Christ, a person of faith, a godly person, a member of the body of Christ, a Christian, first penned in Antioch as a derogatory remark. You're just a bunch of little Jesuses. And the believers said, that's what we aspire to. That's a good description. All of these arise out of an understanding of what is taught in the Bible. The Bible is the source book and authority for the believer, not only about their religious life, but about their whole life. Not only about your religious life, but about your whole life. The starting point for your faith to become saving faith is a clear understanding of who God is as Father but that profession, that understanding of God as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit, drives us to an understanding that we believe in a God who has revealed himself to us. When we come and, be, and we're joined to God through his Son, Jesus Christ, we are brought in the church through the sacrament of baptism. And it is the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that is put upon us. In baptism, we, you might say, have our adoption papers presented. It is this God that you become one with through salvation. 
And a wrong view of who God is will do damage to the kind of faith that you have. Many say they believe in God, but that profession alone is deficient. The question remains, what kind of a God do you believe God to be? And that's where the creeds and the confessions are vital to us, are so important to us. They're not an authority in addition to scripture. They are an authority derived from scripture as summaries of what God's word teaches. Through the true preaching of the gospel, you grow in, the, in your knowledge of who God is and what he has done and what he is doing and what he will do for you throughout all eternity. You have a, a, a solid grasp of what true faith is from your understanding of Heidelberg Catechism, question 21. Many of you young people out here have learned that already. Or if you haven't, you will. For that summarizes what the Bible teaches about true faith. It has two elements. A certain knowledge of what the Bible teaches, coupled with a hearty trust worked in you by the Holy Spirit. And this hearty trust is, is the fruit of the Spirit's work of regeneration wherein you receive new life in Christ. Or as we often refer to it as you are born again by the Spirit of God. So here is the application. What do you learn from Paul's words? That saving faith comes through the hearing of the word of God. Pretty simple, basic, important, essential. So what are you to do with that? Well, the principle should renew your thinking so that you become committed to and driven by a desire for an ever-deepening faith in Jesus Christ. For faith to, to grow, you must put yourself under the hearing of the word of God. Moreover, you must see the worship service as your primary door to communing with the great shepherd of the sheep who know the voice of their shepherd. If God has ordained true faith in your life, to come through the preaching of the word, then opportunities to hear that word preached should rank at the top of your list of priorities. You know, if you're living on 30 minutes of preaching on Sunday morning and afternoon, that is comparable to surviving on oh, eating one day a week, one meal a week. And so you ask yourself the question, are you taking care of your spiritual body to the same degree that you are your physical body? What kind of a hearer are you? If the church is not a high priority for you, understand that will inflict a price on your spiritual life. And it will cause your faith to falter by placing yourself under God's word to become stronger in your love, stronger in your life in Christ, so that your faith will grow. And when it grows, you will be able to reach out. Having grown in the word of God, you will be able to reach out and to encourage others to be hearers as well, which is our calling. It reminds me of David's words in the psalm where he speaks of uh, the, the devastating effects of his hiding his sin with Bathsheba. And he prays unto God and he asks God to revive him and he says, when I have been revived, then I will also lead others. I will always also speak to others of the salvation that's found in our God. And so, so we see that here in this as well. That we must place ourselves under that preaching of the word of God with that, that desire, that hunger, that thirst to grow. So that in growing, we may become zealous for the things of God to the point that we desire others likewise to become zealous for the things of God, encouraging one another and reaching out to those. I often tell my congregation, and I have been emphasizing this as late, that as Christians we see the world as made up not of all kinds of different races. We're one race, we're all the descendants of Adam, but there are two kinds of people those who've been saved by the grace of God 
and those who need to be saved by the grace of God. That's how we look at the world. And we reach out to those who need that grace of God by bringing the gospel to them. Because we have grown and been saved and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen?